Hey, Holly, how's it going? Hi, Lori, doing really well, thank you. How are you? Oh, well, I'm good, and I'm very excited to have you on because I think you have the world's best job. Ah, uh, thank you. I, I feel very lucky. I have a great job, but so do you. You help us communicate all the work that we do, so we appreciate what you do. Well, I want to I wanna know how you landed a job with Jean-Michel Cousteau and Ocean Futures. Uh, ocean, yeah, Ocean Futures. Yeah. Um, so yeah, Jean-Michel Cousteau's is an Ocean Futures Society, and um, right place at the right time. I I graduated from UC Santa Barbara with aquatic biology, marine biology, in the early '90s, and Jean-Michel had just relocated up to Santa Barbara. So this has been his home base now for almost 25 years. And he was setting up a, a few different companies, including continuing a lot of the work that he was doing with his father, the Cousteau Society, but was venturing off on a lot of his own individual ideas and projects. And one of them was education. He definitely, over his many decades of working with his father and, and just traveling around the world, really personally saw the value of education and, 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 and really enticing people to learn to care. It starts with that emotional connection. So getting people outdoors in nature and of course his love is under the sea. So getting them wet. And he's been involved in many different educational programs and, and really the original one that started through the Cousteau Society was Project Ocean Search back in the 70s. And some of the first environmental educational programs with the marine emphasis was the work of Jean-Michel Cousteau and the team. So you got right in there and very soon after, I don't know how soon after, you ended up in Fiji. Yeah, no, I, um, I met Jean-Michel in 93 and I was a dive instructor in town. So that was the connection. And I was also working as a naturalist, as a marine educator. So I was hired by him part-time contract base to do some educational programs on small cruise vessels where we were really enhancing the experience of the passengers by doing these underwater live dives. So that was some of the work I did with Jean-Michel. And so you ended up when Jean-Michel uh, went into partnership with a, a beautiful resort in Fiji, you end up there. So how can you talk about that partnership? How did it happen and how did you end up in Fiji? Sure. Um, well, that was one of their sites for their Project Ocean Search. I think they started doing programs there in the 80s, I want to say mid-80s. Um, and it was managed in, by a different company, owned by a different company, and not considered an eco-resort at all. But Jean-Michel loved the design of the resort. It was definitely based on a traditional Fijian village. 99% um, of the staff were Fijians from the local villages. He loved the, that cultural aspect of it. And, of course, it was right at the doorstep of some of the most beautiful underwater coral reefs in the world. So it was a great location for him to host these Project Ocean Search educational programs. And he just fell in love with the place and the people. And when the resort was was really going into bankruptcy in the early 90s, he knew that, you know, he had no interest in being like the business owner of a resort, but he saw the value of this place and the importance of protecting this place, both culturally and biologically, that he worked with some investors and, and, and then got involved by um, putting his name on the resort to really show that you can be economically viable by offering sort of a high-end resort destination, vacation destination, but yet still be extremely culturally sensitive and restore a lot of the, the native areas that have been impacted by development and by people. So it was a great learning tool for us then to communicate that important connection between a vacation destination and, and tourists really leading with their um, opportunity to be engaged in some of these restoration and educational opportunities. So you you were, you ended up there. You yeah. are teaching. Uh, you're, you're the marine biologist on site. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that was one of the things that Jean-Michel said. If we're going to put my name on the resort, one of the things we have to have in place is he sort of had a short-term list and then a long-term list of, of things to achieve. And the first easy achievable thing to do was to have a full-time naturalist on staff. And this naturalist would 
desirably have a degree in marine biology, have experience in interpretation education, as well as, um, from a research standpoint, engage the guests in some easy sort of citizen science, easy data collecting that can help not only the region to better understand the importance of the reefs and the long-term changes that are happening on coral reefs, but also just to um, empower the, the guests that they're a part of this important data collecting and scientific research. And so I was, I mean, the, the goal was to get a local Fijian, of course, and we just, um, through the University of South Pacific and Suva, we had tried to find that perfect candidate. But in that process, we would hire somebody from the United States or Australia or England, and they would be hired for a year to commit to be the marine biologist on staff. And I was that marine biologist, and I loved it so much, I stayed for 18 months. <laughs> And you got to be at the very beginning. You were on the leading edge of, of doing this kind of work. Now, okay, so you take the resort was a traditional resort, and you move it. You and the team, the very you know the various entities that are involved, you move this into more of a sustainable ecotourism resort. Uh, so that was possible. You didn't create this from the ground up. It was already standing. And then you were able to shift it into something much more sustainable and much more eco-friendly um, without having to do too much, from what I understand. But you did put some specific elements in place. And one of the key elements, which is what Jean-Michel stands for, uh, it's all about education. So you were the education component. Did people... Um, uh, who are coming to the resort, did they come there expecting that? Is that why they came? Or was it just kind of a unique little extra? In my time frame, I was there. So I was there from 99 to um, 2001. So hard to believe it's already been 14 years. So it's been a while. But I think, you know, clientele-wise, um, I would say a large percentage of guests who come, especially those that are divers, come because of the name Cousteau. So with that, there is this level of expectation that, of course, there's going to be some sort of enhancement of, you know, the legacy of Cousteau, which is opening our eyes to not only some of the, the impacts of these fragile underwater ecosystems, but what can I do to help um, create a more sustainable future? So I think most guests did come with the sense that, yes, there'd be some sort of educational component. And the way that we've structured the education program, it's exactly the same as it was when I was there almost 15 years ago. And that is every day is a different theme. And we have activities based on that theme. So Monday is Day of the Coral Reefs. And we do a reef flat walk and um, we do different activities that are related to just coral reefs. And then their evening presentation, which is very casual in the bar lounge area where our biologist now, Johnny, will do a kind of a multimedia presentation about cities under the sea and, 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 and extend what he shares with the guests on a daily basis when he's out with them snorkeling and diving. Um, so every day had a diff has a different theme, and based on that, guests could participate or they don't have to participate. So it's it's really an optional educational opportunity. But um, I could speak from personal experience, and and there's no doubt it was a high percentage of participation because people did have that sense of that's what they were signing up for when when going to this as a destination. Now, not just adults signed up for this. The, mm. I understand that, you know, I know Jean-Michel is very much into uh, teaching the children because we, we could very much well be lost causes because <laughs> we're not doing much to save our world, but the kids will, they're very much engaged. So what did you guys do? How did you engage the kids? Well, well Jean-Michel, of course, is a kid when he's around kids, and so he loves he loves children, and he really has this sense of hope for the future when he does see their excitement and their enthusiasm, and most importantly, the fact that they're sponges. So you could really share some fun, engaging, scientific, as well as entertaining information with them, and then they get it, and they won't forget that experience. So we know that value. And um, we have a Bula camp or Bula club where kids participate um, in daily activities, once again, based on that theme. And, you know, I think from a business standpoint, um, it was definitely a juggling act to kind of cater towards a romantic destination for honeymooners, as well as a family destination for families. The property itself is about 17 acres. There's only 25 little berets or cottages, so it's fairly spread out. But yet, if you're a honeymooner, you don't necessarily want to be right next door to a family of four with two screaming little toddlers. 
So there's a way that we've been able to kind of cater to both of the clientele. And in the back of the property is just this beautiful area just for the kids and with their own swimming pool. And it's next to the garden. It's next to our constructed wetlands. And, of course, it's right close to the beach. And so it has all the components of the accessibility of the outdoor classrooms that we use in our Bula Club. And really what we do is based on a much bigger project that we're involved with, our program called our Ambassadors of the Environment. And we have educational programs with high-end hotels, a small cruise line, um, the Fiji Resort, and even a, a small camp program on Catalina Island. So we have different programs, and they're really under this umbrella of our Ambassadors of the Environment. And the, the general gist of the philosophy is to use the wow of the ocean that really excites kids, and then to engage them to learn just some simple ecological relationships of the critters within the ecosystem, how they help maintain the stability of this underwater ecosystem, them, and what can we learn from sea cucumbers and sponges that could help us think a little more closely about our relationship in our communities and how we need to value every component of our community and maintaining the long-term sustainability. And so our ambassadors program, whether it's teaching coral reef ecology or kelp forest off of Catalina Island, is this really this sustainable message. So how can we look at our own society, our humanity, and better improve our our simple lessons of sustainability so we live within our means of the natural world so the kids are learning this uh, do you find that they are telling the adults um, a lot about what's going on are the adults starting to to uh, get on board with this because you're going after the kids yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And then Jean-Michel has even had personal experience where he, he'll have, he's seen parents come and drop the kids off in the morning and they end up staying for the entire activity or day or so. No, absolutely. I mean, all of our program and yeah, a lot of times Jean-Michel will say well, it's the kids telling the parents what to do. And, you know, we're pretty much set in our ways as adults. And so, uh, but kids have a, a tremendous impact or influence on us. So if, if a child comes home or at the end of the day of activity says that they've learned this, I think it's, it def, definitely rubs off on the parents in a very positive way. Well, I, I certainly noticed this in our own family and, and my daughters keep my husband on a very short leash because he does love his shrimp and, and he now has not allowed to eat it um, because of my kids. And uh, when we go to our, you know, we go on trips every year and my eldest is diving and my younger one is snorkeling and we go to these places where we can have these lovely experiences. Um, we go to restaurants and they'll have grouper and snapper on the list, on the menu and, uh, uh, and tuna and, and uh, the, the, the kids say, Daddy, you're not allowed to eat that. And uh, so these kinds of things, um, the father, you know, my, their father can't say no. So right. uh, <laughs> it's it's it. What you're doing is definitely the way to go to help us change our behaviors because we don't want to we don't want to say no to our kids and our kids have a point and and and, and I would like to see more people getting their children a, involved in these things because they have no idea the kind of ripple effect this is going to have. So how would you suggest? operators, uh, how do you suggest they would get involved with your Ocean Ambassadors program? Is there a way for them to kind of tee up with you? Um, well, absolutely. So, you know, our programs really vary where it's only school groups that participate or it's full entire families. So um, we do have all of the above. And I think what's really important from a, an environmental educational standpoint, and, and, and we're challenged with this all the time, is not to stand high on the soapbox and preach, 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 but to try to practice what we're preaching. So at our places like resort, at the Fiji Resort and our newest project in Petite St. Vincent is we try to implement some of these ideas that we're showing, demonstrating within these underwater ecosystems. Like in nature, there is no waste. So then how can we be more effective and efficient in reusing, reducing, recycling? We hear about the three R's, but let us show tangible examples of how we're doing this in a small resort setting. And so that is very important. And for kids, for instance, on Catalina Island, which was really our first flag flagship of a, an outdoor educational program for school groups, um, they have a beautiful garden, a really amazing composting system. So as kids are snorkeling in the kelp forest and seeing sea cucumbers as these deposit 
feeders or the sort of sanitary engineers, they're learning that at camp, we also are those sea cucumbers and we're recycling and we're composting everything. One of the activities is devoted just to composting and gardening. So they're not only learning kelp forest ecology, but they're seeing all these simple lessons of nature actually working to their benefit. And so it, it, it then adds into this beautiful garden. And from a business standpoint, as Jean-Michel always says, it, it comes back to saving money. Yes, we're saving the environment. Yes, we're doing this good thing. But really, we're saving money in the long run. So in our in our resort in Fiji, the, the garden is just gorgeous. And it, every year I go back, it's just bigger and better and, and more variety of fruits and vegetables. And when Jean-Michel was first involved, and, and, and trying to create a garden, he was told, you'll never be able to grow anything. This is a sandy peninsula, no soil-rich nutrients. You'll never be able to grow anything. And now they're growing 70% plus of the vegetables and fruit that they use within the actual restaurant and the resort. So that's, that's a simple, tangible demonstration we could share with the guests and one of the activities is to walk through the resort and show them all the green programs we're doing um, and just to give them ideas and examples on how easy it is and how simple it can be then implemented back at home this is uh this this must go back home and i bet um it uh People go back after they've had this kind of experience and they tell their friends and, and uh, explain to them all the things they've learned while on vacation and they had a, a total blast doing it. Do you get a lot of repeat guests coming back to... Uh it is. And when I saw that question, I wish I had time to call um, the gentleman who does a lot of our reservations based in San Francisco and then our management company. But not, So I can't give you the exact percentage, but when I was there and, and the couple times I've been back since, there's no doubt a handful of repeat guests. In fact, we're almost challenged to come up with new activities because when people do go, they do go for at least a full week. So they're getting almost every day's worth of activities. And then if they come back in a year or two or three, we're wanting to provide them new activities. Um, so that's fun for us as we're continuing to come up with engaging and entertaining and exciting activities for the guests to do, especially for those repeat guests that do come back. So well, that's a good place to be when you have to rejig your program because you're so popular. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I better go test them out in the field first before we actually get real. So. Uh, make sure you get that job. That'll be fun. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So, okay. So our, our, our summiters are probably listening to this and saying, well, that's fine. This is a five-star resort. Um, I can't do this. I, I don't run a five-star operation. Um, this is, I, you can only do this if you're getting you know, high rates. Um, so what do you say to those people? Um, I agree in the sense that you're right. We, we're, re we're reaching a pretty small sliver of the population, but economically that population does have a, a tremendous impact on the choices they make. And so I think for anybody and everybody, and as, as Jean-Michel and, um, and other team members from Motion Features, as public presentations, you know, we're talking to a vast wide range of demographics. I think it's important for everybody to, you know, not wanting to be a commercial for the Fiji Resort. I'm just giving an example of where we've been intimately involved in trying to turn it into an eco resort and make that mainstream. And, and for any traveler and no matter a backpacker or whatever your economic means are in traveling and picking a destination is to do your homework and, and pick the um, operators that are doing their best um, to try to implement some of these you know green ideas or, or provide an educational opportunity and conservation um, I think that's what's so important and so we really vote with our wallet so if we could encourage travelers to do the same and it doesn't have to be an eco resort but are they trying to minimize their plastic pollution are they indeed depending on the local population for employment? Are they doing some outreach into the local school systems or providing medical services or, or whatever it is? I mean, we are really just visitors uh, from the Western world coming into a lot of these desirable destinations where I think we have a sense of responsibility. And as a, as a tourist, so we need to support those groups that are doing their best to really support the local community that they have their resort in. Your um, the the whole concept of ecotourism and 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 having it 
uh, spread out to the to the the broader the broader world. Mm-hmm. You you've actually taken ecotourism and be, and it's not just ecotourism. It is it is sustainable tourism. It's it's, envir- it's environmentally sustainable, culturally sustainable. Uh, tourism which is also economically sustainable so even though it's called an eco resort it's actually more than just the environment that uh that the the fiji resort is it's you you have brought in uh you have considered the local population um and i've been i've actually been on uh, TripAdvisor reading reviews <laughs> and oh, it's really? very interesting to hear <laughs> some of the things that people say and uh-huh. one of the things they say is um you know, you go to some some places and you can feel the tension between between you and locals, um, but not so at this resort. And I, and I know that Fiji is known for its its hospitality, but um, the the, the uh, people who are working at the resort, um, they they are so open and so generous, and they say things like "Welcome home," and and they really do make you feel at home, and they really do um, they treat you as though you are guests and they're your hosts. And so it, it gives a whole different uh, feel to the vacation uh, by incorporating the, the social aspects and the cultural aspects. And I had no idea that, that there was so much, um, you know, cultural presentations and cult- cultural incorporation into the activities that you do. But it makes total sense because Fiji is such an amazing culture. Um, but I, I think that people walk away uh, gobsmacked because... They go to other places where you could be in on, in Miami Beach. It could it could be anywhere in the world, uh, but people really want to have an experience. And by taking it just from the eco side to the fully sustainable side, and you're incorporating the whole the whole environment, uh, not just the underwater environment. It it uh, it creates a sustainable business, a sustainable profits, you know, Absolutely. and and uh, sustain. You can sustain it because you can get. You can get really good employees that really love to do what they're doing. One guy said, um, um, who wouldn't want to work here? I can uh, take off my T-shirt and jump in the ocean anytime I want. <laughs> I yeah. mean, that's, that's, that's fantastic. And, and to have that kind of uh, uh, ethic, work ethic with your, yeah, your well, staff. None of us who've been involved in PG could ever say enough about um, how beautiful the Fijians are and, and they just have a heart of gold. So they, they naturally have this sense of hospitality and grind with them with no professional training. So they are just genuine, generous, um, wonderful people who have quite pride in their culture that they're very open and welcome to sharing it. And so, um, for me, to be there and just to kind of be out of our, our, our bubble or our kind of rat race of where I live in California or, you know, I was fairly young in my professional career and, and definitely looked at that as just this great escape. The Fijians just gave me the sense of a value of, of simplicity and community, um, living still very traditionally multi families within same dwellings within a community where they depend on their neighbors Um, and a sense of sustainability of their natural environment without really me having to come in from a scientific standpoint and say, are you sure you should be really fishing for that big grouper? It's like they get it because that's what they've been doing for hundreds of years, if not thousands of years. So um, we have a lot to learn, and I think we always say the importance of protecting biological diversity. Well, we also need to protect cultural diversity, and there's a lot we can learn from different cultures. And with the staff, the majority of staff being Fijians, and I should say Indo-Fijians too, as there's a, a large percentage of, of Indian Fijians that have been brought over a few generations ago, um, and they, of course, are a part of the population and a part of our staff too. Um, it's it's a great cultural opportunity. And our day of the week on Tuesday is Fijian culture, and it does. I mean, every day involves snorkeling and diving in the morning. Then the afternoon visit or excursion is a visit to the local village, and it's the village Nukumbalavu where most of the staff actually live. So we're literally going home with the staff into the village. Um, you know, meeting sort of the the chief and the the high the 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 people that kind of maintain the, the the services of the of the 
village and just see how they all work together. They do a traditional meke, a, a traditional dance. We do a traditional kava ceremony. We bring kava to the chief, thanking him for our visit into the village or letting him letting us come into his village. Um, so there's just a lot of great traditional components that we kind of take for granted or we've sort of lost that within our own community. And so there's it's a lot of valuable lessons. And, and once again, we didn't have to write anything out, script anything out. It just naturally happens. And and so that's the beautiful part of, of how easy it has been to be involved in a place like Fiji. And I know there's many other places around the world. Um, it's just, you know, what we really took a liking to very early on and has devoted, we've devoted a, a lot of our time in, in protecting that, that Jean-Michel first experienced, you know, 30 years ago. And a lot of the same staff are still there. I mean, Mario and um, so many of the same staff that were there when Jean-Michel and, and Dr. Richard Murphy and Don Santee were doing Project Ocean Search in the 80s. And if they're not still working, their kids and grandkids are. So there's this real sense of extended family, which is very beautiful. Wow. You know, what, what you're saying about uh, the whole cultural aspect and, and, and taking people in the village and seeing how everybody in these traditional villages are so integrated and, and uh, um, just uh, it, there's a, it's, it's a beautiful interdependence that, that works. Um, I was talking to Peter Sale, who's a, he's an ec ecologist, and he talks about, um, uh, about the coral reef communities and how they're so diverse and every everything is different everything has its own type of habitat and its own needs its own own um uh, uh just its own own way of interrelating with the the outside world and yet the coral reef community is this this beautiful integrated complex rich and totally balanced uh uh you know, ecosystem and 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 then you kind of went, wouldn't you know our our world our our society uh, that's where we need to go is to to look at some of these the societies that are integrated they're complex they have multiple uh, facets to them and yet they all work together so what your resort is doing is is doing what we're talking about coral reef communities do they interrelate they they work together and it makes it very rich and and an amazing experience and it, it's funny how the coral reef is always projecting back on us our our <laughs> our, our own status in, in in the world and and when the coral reefs are in trouble that's merely a reflection that we're in trouble i Absolutely. just want to ask you um one question about that and ocean issues at when you do your education um are you pretty specific on the kinds of issues that uh coral reefs are facing, do you tell people, you know, these are the problems, you know, uh, what, what do you say to people? How do, and yeah, how do you say it? And When I was there in Fiji, actually, in 2000, we had a pretty major bleaching episode. And it literally happened overnight, and it was pretty widespread, I'd say across maybe 80% of our, our local dive sites. Um, and we were working with Dr. Level from uh, Suva from the University of South Pacific, and he had already um, established a few permanent sites, sort of very simple like reef check type uh, data collecting using indicator species and then trying to set up these per permanent transect lines. And so we were then working with the fisheries from the local city with Sabu Sabu um, and trying to better understand this bleaching episode and, and to document it, photo document it through videos down this transect line. And that's just some baseline information we do not have in most places around the world. So when we see such a drastic, dramatic event that happens like chlor coral bleaching, um, it does provide an opportunity to bring up a lot of the stressors that do impact the reef. And one of the things that we do at the resort, and, and once again, we always try to bring it back to sort of that sense of hope and that sense of, of conservation on what does work. And one of the things is we don't offer on our menu in our restaurant any reef species from, our, from the reef. So no groupers, no parrotfish. So the only fish we serve are generally pelagic fish that are sustainably harvested. So sustainable seafood, as you mentioned, your husband loving shrimp is, and there's 
there are some sustainable shrimp options, is that's, that's another responsibility of the consumer. And that's where we really try to empower the guest. And, you know, once again, we don't want to say, heaven forbid, you should never eat this. But we want to give them some great options and they could enjoy delicious fresh, fresh seafood at a resort, but feel confident that it was harvested in a sustainable way. Minimal bycatch and um, not from the local reef. As we know, most reef species, especially grouper, can be very geographically limited in their distribution. So if you fish one reef area really quickly, the chances of some of those bigger fish coming back is pretty slim. And the Fijians know that. So they they took to that desire of us to not serve reef fish as a welcome, a welcome opportunity. Many reefs, and I've seen sort of this dialogue even on listservs like the Coral Reef listserv, is they... Scientists are shocked that they go to this resort and they're trying to do everything they can on land and they're completely neglecting the reef except for educational opportunities with divers. But yet you go to lunch and you're having grouper for dinner or lobster and everything is, was fished right there on their own reef, which is their own classroom. So I think what we try to do is to empower the consumer to know that we are doing some great things. And this is one example in sustainable seafood. And that's for sure a message that guests could then take home and feel empowered that they have, you know, we've got everything within the pond of our hands now with our phone our smartphones and we could access any information anytime and, and to make then those choices that we know we're supporting the fisher folks because jean Michel will be the first to say i'm the, on the side of the fishermen like i want them to stay in business and so we as consumers then need to support those fisheries that are managed correctly uh with a sustainable you know mandate and the fishermen doing everything they can to meet those regulations and you can do this um, at, um, at the Fiji Island Resort because because the Fijians already get this. And do well, they, not- but they like they they like grouper and they like parrotfish, and so they they eat a lot of that back at home. But they also, you know, when um, when a chief passes away, out of respect for the chief, they close off their reef, which is basically like closing your refrigerator for a hundred days and a hundred nights, because they know the ocean is extremely resilient. If we just take our hands off for a short period of time, um, many of those species will come back. And then, of course, the value, and we now have a lot of great scientific data to prove the importance of spillover. And so if you set up a marine protected area and, and value that as a no fishing area, the outside area, surrounding area, can be extremely uh, enriched in a very short period of time and become then an opportunity to, to fish for a certain species in a sustainable way. And we've been involved in a very important marine protected area out at a little island called Namena, Namena Lala, which is about a 45 minute boat ride from our resort out to this tiny little island of, I don't know, only a couple acres. And it does have a small resort on it of, of six little bungalows or burrays. But around it is this huge fringing reef of just some of the best diving I've ever done. And, and definitely it's so refreshing to go back there. I was just there last year with Jean-Michel on production for our IMAX film. And to see what I saw 15 years ago with very little changes. If anything, there's even more fish more stingrays, more sharks, because the marine protected area has gone into place. And the locals, they're be- they become their, the own enforcement because they see the value in it from an ecotourism standpoint. It becomes such a valuable dive destination that they then are the ones that are calling the, the cops on any t- any poaching that might happen in there. Right, right. Mm-hmm. Well, this 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 brings me to an, an, uh, another question, and, and that is... Um, you're now, uh, uh, what's it like being a movie star? <laughs> <laughs> Underwater, it's really fun. I just swim, <laughs> dive, and swim with Jean-Michel and point things out. We point things out for each other, and there just happens to be somebody with a camera following us. So it's pretty, it's 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 very enjoyable. And I know, um, you know, productions in general can be a little hectic and stressful, and we're definitely dependent on good weather and good diving conditions. Um, but I've always been very fortunate to work with just such an enjoyable team. And our most recent production, um, with 3d entertainment, um, is, is, has just been extremely delightful. So we focused on Fiji because we're very familiar with Fiji and especially Nemena, the Nemena Marine Reserve. And we knew we could have everything from the small little Christmas tree worms to the big tridacna clams 
to seahorses, to sharks, to, you know, everything was there that we needed. So we, we camped out there. The team was there for almost three weeks and Jean-Michel and I were there for just over a week. And, um, you know, it's, it's that opening poster of, of our IMAX film. And that's just Nemena, a dive site called Chimneys, because it is referred to as the soft coral capital of the world. And every color of the rainbow from the soft corals to all the basslets and all the reefs fish it's just a, a beautiful stimulating stunning image and to then see it on a hundred foot screen in 3d is, is just breathtaking so I didn't really answer your question to be a movie star it's, it's very humble and I think it comes with a sense of responsibility and, and that's where Jean-Michel continues to always inspire me is um, sure he's been fortunate with this name Cousteau but he he works extremely hard to carry on that important message of people protecting what they love what his father used to always say and in this period of time since his father co-invented scuba in 43 1943 we've seen the biggest degradation in our oceans in all of human history and so as we're discovering more we're losing much of its richness and diversity so as we engage people with the equipment that's been um, developed um, we feel then divers have to become our those ambassadors to help articulate what's changing. And I mean, we've all met divers that said, God, I, I just remember how beautiful the Caribbean was 20 years ago. And now it's really hard to find some of those same spots. And so that's really sad to, to say that in our own lifetime. And, and, and us as adults, we have to take that sense of responsibility. So um, it, it really gives us a sense of a mission. And Jean-Michel, of course, has this call of urgency with always these great stories of hope. And Namena Island is one of the many, many great stories of hope. And we love the work that Sylvia Earle does with her hope spots. And I think we all personally have our own hope spot of where we see that um, there is still much to protect. And, and that's what we want to engage divers and dive tour operators to value what they have to knowing that it could slip away if we don't engage in that conservation education. Well, you know, I was really lucky to um, have worked with Jean-Michel uh, back in the early 90s um, and the mid-90s. Uh, I didn't know that. Did yeah, I, know that? I did. Yeah, yeah. And, and that was um, for... with the aggressor fleet. And um, okay. uh, one of the things that he instilled in me was this whole idea of the ocean, being an ocean ambassador. It has never left me. And uh, that, that is actually one of the reasons why I'm doing the summit, because I think that we in the dive industry, we, we must be ocean ambassadors because who else is better positioned to do this? Who else? It's us. Yeah. You know, and, and so this is why I'm so appreciative that you and Jean-Michel um, have, have come on to the summit because uh, uh, you guys are the reason why we, the summit is even happening, is, is this whole idea of the ocean ambassador. And I think, you know, it's almost like even listening to like a financial advisor, like a lot of times we're intimidated because we're sort of embarrassed. And, and I think the dive industry, I think we all need to accept that we're not perfect. And even though we, we say we have these flagship resorts that we're involved with, there's still a lot of improvements that could be made on a daily basis and on a yearly basis and establishing these goals on, on what do we want to achieve. So, of course, the bottom line is economic viability. So to, to then kind of um, invest in a big solar or wind energy or some sort of renewable energy, um, you know, doesn't make sense immediately, but to set up some long-term goals. And one of the long-term goals we had in Fiji was this idea of this um, recycling the gray water, these constructed wetlands. And we now do that at our property. And, and because of the success of this, there's very little nutrient waste washing out onto the reefs. And um, it becomes a very important water source then for our garden and then just all the landscaping. And this is a simple model that could easily be replicated, but it does take an initial investment. So it, it, the, the investors, the resort owners needs to see there's a long-term value but there needs to be that economic upfront of willingness to do it. Because if we maintain business as you know, status quo, and especially in many remote parts and, and where there isn't the infrastructure of recycling a lot of our water waste, it does go right into the ocean. And there's no 
doubt that that's a huge negative impact on the reef and it's the reef that's attracting the tourists. So those are the simple connections we try to make and to give models of an example. We're not the engineers, we are not going to come in and do it, but we work with companies that have a great track record and in fact our, our um, relationship in Petite St. Vincent and the resort owner who gets it, he is hiring the same company to come in and look at the feasibility of a constructed wetlands on his small island of Petite St. Vincent. And this is once again modeled after what has been working well in Fiji. So that's where we hope to, to come in with, with sort of that enticement and inspiration um, and then utilize, you know, everything that we have established in relationships to then put those people together to make it happen. Well, you know, th there, are, there are a number of resorts around the world, such as the Fiji Island Resort, but there's a number out there that are on the bleeding edge of this, right? So um, yeah. you guys are taking the economic hit, the initial investment, the initial risk, and now, it's, it, now because you've already done it, um, the, the technology and the, 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 just the process of, of putting this into place uh, will be a lot less expensive for other people to come in behind you and, 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 and use these technologies that you've, you've already tested and are finding to work. So it's, it's all good for everybody, and, and maybe this is a, a, the big bonus of being a five-star a five resort is that you can do this stuff, but also now um, you've put in the investment and it can be shared with with other resorts because you've done it it's obviously can be done and so mm -hmm. now it's it's cheaper there's less of a a risk really because uh, it works you know it works yeah. it's 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 ready to ready to roll there's there's yeah. no um initial risk investment it's just it's the money it's just the money yeah yeah and I think the last important component that I, I feel it would be nice to see more resorts do is sort of restoration. And whether that's um, part of a proceeds that goes into a fund to support local research or engaging your own guests in doing restoration. So just once again, just an example in Fiji because that's where we just have a lot of experience and for me personal experience is it used to be a big coconut plantation. Can you kind of see all the coconut trees? Oh, yeah. <laughs> At the point at this far end, it used to be a very large mangroves, but it was all cut down for the coconut trees. And we know mangroves in general in, develop, in, in areas of development, they're not necessarily looked upon as an aesthetic pretty tree. It blocks your view. It, sometimes people say they smell and they attract bugs. But it's a critical link between the land and the sea. And we know, um, you know, from the coral reefs that a lot of the reef fish species depend on the mangroves as a nursery. So that's part of our educational component of the importance of bringing the mangroves back. And so we put the guests to work. And on Thursdays, it's the day of the mangrove. <laughs> and we're going to snorkel and dive and have a lot of fun, come back and have a great lunch. And then we jump in our boats and we head up to this little island where there's a very large stretch of mangroves and we pick the seed we collect the seedlings and we bring them back and the guests help us plant the seedlings and so and they take quite like this is my tree I want to come back in a couple of years and see if it has actually taken root and is growing and so we mark them and and it's and especially for kids it's just a great way to to, to show them how easy it is to restore some of these ecosystems that we did not necessarily have the full understanding of the value, but how easy we could bring them back. And we also have a tridacna farm of clams. Oh, clam farms. <laughs> and they're just as big, almost like lobster type uh, cages right at the pier base of uh, of our pier and same thing is as the guests and the staff will help us scrub the cages and make sure there's not too much algae growth so the clams are also getting the sunlight for their little single cell algae that lives inside the zozantheli and um, they take quite pride in their clams and they help keep the cages clean so and even the Fijians when they then go out and look for some clams to eat and they know there aren't very many clams left they know that maybe I don't need to take all five of them in this one area. Maybe I'll just take one. And so they, they understand a little bit about the biology and broadcast spawning and how these clams, once they mature, they're going to help seed the entire reef. And, and it's just, once again, a learning opportunity without really emphasizing, um, you know, heaven forbid, I can't believe we're doing this, but look what we can do to be a part of the solution. So really solution-based with a sense of hope is, I think, the key to environmental success when it comes to education. I agree. Solution based with a sense of hope. 
and and there's certainly you have your head underwater so much you can see all these places around the world that really there is tremendous hope for us and uh, with more and more people uh, sharing information about how these ecosystems work and how amazing they are um, and how we need to uh, not take out one of the little pins otherwise everything falls apart um, I think we're going to have more hope spots because we're doing this and if the industry would uh, get more involved we have lots of involvement from a few people but we get more people involved in this oh man change change is going to happen fast it's, it's very exciting well, absolutely. And I think, I think as consumers choose some of these destinations that have this sense of connection to the cultural environment and environment and just the natural beauty, I think more and more businesses will start to catch on. I mean, there's no doubt that ecotourism 15, 20 years ago was sort of for the tree huggers and, and, and whale savers, but now it's really mainstream. And, and there's no doubt that people are looking sort of with more of a conscious mind when picking a vacation destination. So I think it's up, up to tour operators to make more options available where people could have that educational experience and or know that the resort is doing everything they can to, to best minimize their environmental footprint. Yeah, it's all about the quality of the experience, right? I mean, uh, this is what you, you're providing, a high quality experience, and more and more people are, are looking for that experience. Uh, the most valuable thing we have is time, and we want to put that money into, uh, in, into a vacation spot that gives us the, the, the best experience. And, and that's what you're doing. And I, I'm sure more and more people are moving in that direction as we run into f fewer and fewer moments to be able to go on vacation. We want to put that money in the right spot. And I want to thank you guys for being, the, uh, being some of the leaders on this. This is, this, is, this is what we need. This is what we need. Well, we, we, we can't do it alone. We definitely depend on the, the resort owners and the managers and the investors, most importantly, the staff, and then their buy-in on the whole reason why we want to do it. And, of course, Jean Michel has such a talented team that we all work together, and um, it has to be definitely a group collaborative effort, and there's still always room for improvement. So we learn from other operators around the world, too, and always wanting to kind of strive to improve. Well, let's keep sharing. Let's keep sharing all this great stuff because uh, the, the information needs to get out to more and more people. And, and I appreciate um, all the resources you and Jean-Michel have provided us uh, that we can share with, with everybody here on the summit. Um, so the next time I see you, Holly, um, I'm going to be in Montreal and I'm going to be seeing you on the uh, 3D screen. <laughs> Oh, good. Are you going to see the French version or the English version? Um, it doesn't really matter to us. The kids are bilingual, so um, we'll, we'll see what's up. <laughs> well, either way, you'll enjoy it, definitely. And, and I think really one of the best parts of my job is just to inspire people to follow along with Jean-Michel because, you know, we know personally how motivating he is when you get to see him in person. So whether it is in an IMAX film on a 100-foot screen, but better, any type of public event, um, he does spend majority of his time sharing his passion. So any opportunity to see him speak at any any engagement and a great way to follow is just through Ocean Futures, which is a free membership in his marine conservation organization. And by signing up, you'd get our monthly newsletters. And one thing we do mention is, um, of course, um, ways to see Jean-Michel at a public appearance. So, for instance, he's going to be in Minneapolis on May 7th speaking with both Celine and Fabienne, his two children. And so to have all three of them on stage is just, it's a treasure to see and extremely inspiring and motivating. So anybody in that region of the country, it's a great opportunity to hear them um, personally up close and, and to take that message home and, and really create change. So we need to make sure we share that page that we're, where uh, uh, Jean-Michel and, and the gang are going to be presenting because I know you do a lot of presentations too Holly and and you're a you're you're a wonderful presenter and and so we want to make sure we keep in touch with you and yeah, uh, keep keep on uh, keep track of you you're everywhere you're everywhere mm -hmm. we want to be ah uh, well you too Lori and I, we're excited for the summit and excited to hear from everybody and um, it's always just educational for us all and isn't that the best part of our job at the end of the day and when I go get home and see my 10 year old, I say, this is what I learned today about the ocean. I mean, there's still so much to learn and improve on. And, and it's, you put together an amazing group of people. So thank you for all that you do. And we're happy to be a part of it. 
Well, we'll, we'll uh, bring everybody together and share all the good news. And, uh, and I think people will be uh, very inspired and very motivated and realizing that there's a lot of support out there for all of us to go out and uh, make some really valuable changes to our businesses and the way we, we view our role in the world. Listen, Absolutely. thanks so much, Holly. My pleasure, Lori. Thank you. Okay. Take care now. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.